today we get just an extra special thing, kind of top off the weekend. A good friend of mine is here. His name is Caleb Kaltenbach, and I know you guys have been excited about him coming and speaking for us, but Caleb is the author of three books. He's got another book coming up this fall, um, Messy, Messy Leadership, or excuse me, Messy Truth. Uh, Messy Grace is kind of the book that has just hit everywhere. I mean, it tells Caleb's story, just a great leadership story about where he comes from, what he's about, and really tackles the issue of grace and truth, along with the ideas of relationships and gender and, and marriage and all those different things. And so I think you're in for a great treat. Now, the only problem with Caleb um, is he is a Chiefs fan, so be a... Uh, <laughs> He's a little hyped up today, a little excited about last week, and uh, we've got a bunch of Broncos fans here, so don't kill the guy, but um, I think he's going to do a phenomenal job, and it's going to be exciting. Um, I would encourage you, just Kayla's books, uh, Messy Grace is a must read, and so you just go on Amazon and grab that one. Um, also, The God of Tomorrow, just a phenomenal book. I would encourage you to grab those and get those in your library, just excellent, excellent books. It helps us just balance this issue of grace and truth. And so I want to just both campuses right now, would you help me just give a huge rocky welcome to Caleb Kaltenbach as he comes to share with us today. Whew. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's, a couple things. Let's get it straight, okay? First of all, Okay, I know some of you are like, yeah, I don't like the Chiefs. Okay, listen, okay, the feeling is mutual. However, my son is a Broncos fan. He's never been in Denver. I don't, what? No, stop. You don't clap at that. Why are we clapping? We're clapping. I don't know. Um, the other thing is, can we at least unite behind the fact that the Raiders didn't win? And the Patriots? Yeah, like Brady and Bellatrix are like Thanos with all their different rings on and everything. And so like, I, I, we, we can all get there. And, and honestly, I know you may not like the Chiefs. You got to admit, our quarterback's pretty cool, man. Um, I heard he gives away just a ton of his salary to foster kids and kids in the foster system. And he's a Christian. So you got to root for him because he's going to be in heaven with you. Um, or maybe not with some of you. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Hopefully. Um, I, I love Pastor Sean. You guys love Pastor Sean and the leadership team here? Yeah. They're a great team. I've known Sean since I was in college. If you need stories on him, I'm happy to provide. Uh, pictures or anything, I'm happy to provide, seriously. So he is a great dude. Uh, you guys are blessed to have him. If I lived in this area, this is the church that I would attend. And I know that there are people uh, watching here at, at, the Fredericksburg, uh, ca at the Fredericks campus, uh, this one, and then the Niwot. And then a lot of people are going to be watching online because of the snow or because they have the stomach flu and they don't want to share. And we appreciate you not sharing. And we hope you get better soon. Uh, I, I'm married to my wife, Amy, and we live in the Los Angeles area because we enjoy not having money and giving it away <laughs> to the government. Um, whole nother sermon. Um, <laughs> she is a therapist, and you can tell she's had a lot of work here. Uh, she didn't really have to do her hours even. <laughs> it's just, look who I'm married to. And we have two kids. We have a seventh grade son named Joel, a uh, fifth grade daughter named Rachel, and they are amazing. My wife um, uh, is just a, a, a fiery Latina, which I love. And um, it, she, seriously, I wish you could meet her. She is tall. She's tan. She's got a six-pack she goes to the gym every day. I think you can tell that I watch a lot of Netflix. <laughs> and in her wildest imagination, she had no clue that her knight in shining armor would look like a cross between uh, Uncle Fester, Gru, and Dr. Evil. I mean, <laughs> this is her eye candy. She wakes up to every morning. She is a lucky lady. And so actually, my, my wife loves uh, Sean and Jen and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm glad to be here with you. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about me. I preached here before at this church, um, and I'm not going to do the same sermon. I'm going to talk about a similar subject, but not the same sermon. So I'll just tell you a little bit about me up front. My parents were both professors at the University of Missouri, Columbia, when I was two years old. And when I was two, they divorced, and they both went into same-sex relationships. My dad had several different friends, never had one monogamous partner or husband, but my mother uh, met a psychologist named Vera who had just finished her PhD at MU and they moved to Kansas City, thus Chiefs. 
and they, uh, they, she got a practice there. My mom started working at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, they were very activist oriented. They joined the local board of directors of GLAAD there. Um, and, and so my whole childhood, I was raised in the LGBTQ community in Kansas City. And they would take me with them to activist events, parties, bars, campouts, uh, house parades. You know, I, I don't like camping. I, I know this is not the state to say that in. My idea of camping is Holiday Inn. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to own it. You got to own who you are. I don't care, right? But, but I mean, like, honestly, you know, people say, oh, I bet you saw some difficult things there. I'm like, no, actually, they're a lot cooler than Christians I know today. Um, they had better attitudes, and they were more fun to be around. Um, but I remember this one pride parade when I was 9, 10, or 11. I was marching in with my mom and her partner, Vera. At the end of it, there were all these Christians holding up signs saying, God hates you, no room for you. And when people from the parade would go try to talk to them in dialogue, they would get doused with water and urine saying, this is what Jesus thinks about you. I remember looking at my mom, and I said, Mom, why are they acting like that? And she said, and I'll never forget, Caleb, those are Christians. Christians hate gay people. If you're not like them, they will not like you. And I saw it prove time and time again. I saw, I saw families ignoring their young sons dying of AIDS in the 1980s. I saw my mom's friends get beaten up because of their orientation or the relationships that they were in. I listened to TV preachers, or, or, or sorry, I didn't. Li I listened to radio preachers just dismiss people um, who uh, identified in different ways, and I thought to myself, I never want to become a Christian because if Christians are this bad, I can't imagine how awful Jesus Christ is. Just real quick, I think we really underestimate how much the way we treat people, the words we say, how much we manage and develop our faith, our character, and our integrity will either reinforce somebody to want to follow Jesus or walk away from Jesus. We have more influence over people than what we know. And, and so um, by the time I got to be 16, I was sneaking out at night, living it up, partying it up. I got invited when I was 16 to a Bible study by another high schooler in my high school. Uh, and he led this Bible study for high schoolers. And I thought, this is going to be great. I'm going to go and I'm going to be a pretend Christian, uh, a ninja Christian, and dismantle their beliefs, and that worked out real well, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> like, seriously, I walked into their house, and if this describes your house, I'm not trying to make fun of you. More power to you. As long as you don't have a Nickelback poster up, I'm good with you. Um, I walked in, and like, I had never stepped foot in a Christian household before, especially one like this. And like, they had all the Christian bookstore, Bible bookstore pictures on the wall. You know what I mean? They had the framed pictures of sheep and lions, and I'm like, this is the weirdest thing that I've ever seen. I've never seen somebody have a framed picture of an animal they didn't own <laughs> up on the wall with Bible verses. They had their own breath mints. Did you guys know that we have our own breath mints? <laughs> Testaments? <laughs> Some of you are like, huh? Google it later, not now. Like, don't ever try it, though, unless you want to see what cyanide and um, uh, peppermint taste like together. Uh, then try it, please. You'll, you'll, it'll ruin your day completely. My friend comes up from the basement and says, oh, we're all gathered in the basement in a circle. Come join us. And I'm thinking, this is the beginning of a horror movie. And <laughs> sacrifice a chicken downstairs. And so we went down there, and everybody's reading from 1 Corinthians. I can't find 1 Corinthians. I didn't know that God put a table of contents in the Bible. And so open up the Bible, trying to find it. I read a verse from 1 Chronicles about some dude getting impaled. And they said, where are you? And I said, well, I'm in, I'm in First Chronicles. They said, oh, you're in the Old Testament. And I was like, is there a new one? <laughs> like, is there an updated 2.0? I just thought the Bible was a, was a boring list of, of books written thousands of years ago that by a, a bunch of dead Middle Eastern people. That's what I thought. But the more that I read, the more that I realized that Jesus is presented in the Scriptures was not like the people on the street corners. He was not like the people in the hospitals ignoring their sons. He was not beating people up, okay? Or dare I say today, dare I say, he was not like people on social media. Yeah, now it got quiet. He had very, very deep theological convictions, and he had very real expectations for how you and I should live our lives and pursue holiness. But he also had very personal relationships with people 
who were marginalized and outcast, people that the religious elite, the religious leaders of his day would have nothing to do with. And I love what Pastor Andy Stanley says down in North Point Church in Atlanta. The people uh, who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus, and he liked them back. And I was like, I can get on board with that. I don't want the sheep picture, and I still don't have one in my house. But I'm on board with him. And I ended up, uh, I ended up uh, becoming a Christian, studying. Um, I had to tell my parents I was a Christian. Their response was to kick me out of the house. People were like, how, how is that? Because my parents are homo sapiens. Just like you. Just like me. You're like, should he say that in church? I'm just saying they're human. <laughs> and humans do dumb things all the time. If you don't believe me, look at Twitter. <laughs> humans do dumb things all the time. But here's the deal. When you follow Jesus, you are commanded by God to love people no matter what. You don't get the right to be all gossipy. You don't get the right to hold grudges. You don't get the right to treat people poorly. You don't get the right to slander people. You don't get the right to be prejudiced or racist. You don't get the right to lie to people. You don't get the right to be passive aggressive. You don't get the right to ignore people or be indifferent. You don't get those rights. When you said, I'm following Jesus, he says, love your enemies. Love the people you don't like and the people that don't like you. Love the people where you don't understand why they're in this kind of a relationship, why they have these views, why they work for that organization, why they uh, espouse these system of ethics, why they made this decision, why they voted for that candidate over there, you know. You are commanded to love those people. You are, you are not, never, to label anybody or dismiss them because of things in their life that you disagree with. So how do we do that? Well, to do that, we're going to look at a parable that Jesus told. Now, if, if it's your first time to church, you might hear the word parable, and you're like, parable? What's that? Okay, a parable is a story. It's a fictitious story that Jesus would make up. And usually in a parable, you always had God personified by a character. There's somebody who's kind of representing God in the story, metaphor. And then you had usually the audience who was listening to Jesus. And then over here, you had Jesus sometimes. You had other people. You had the everyday people who were listening to him. And he would tell this story, and usually in parables, things are extremely exaggerated to make a point. But every parable has one big idea. And I think that the big idea of this parable that Jesus tells, I think is going to help us know how we can be people who love others, even the people we don't agree with. Because here's the deal, we want them to see just how much God loves them. And I think when people see how much God loves them, God's grace seems irresistible. I think his grace seems like something that, you, that they can't turn down. But guess what? You can make God's grace seem really resistible when you treat them like a jerk. When you ignore them. I don't care which side of the argument you're coming on. If you're on one side or the other like this, that's called a false dichotomy. I prefer to be in the middle and just love people. And so Jesus is going to teach us this principle. And, and, and Jesus, just to set the context, he is eating dinner at this wealthy guy's house, and you know he's, he's trying to add some value to what people are saying. He's teaching them. He's saying, hey, don't, don't try to sit in the most important seats and that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, one guy says, you know what? It'll be great when we're in the kingdom of heaven. And with the context with what he's talking about, yes, that, that's a good thing. But the context with what he was talking about is that it'll be great when we're in the kingdom of heaven because we will not have to put up with all the people that are crippled, with all the people that are different from us. We're going to be surrounded by everybody who's like us. And I don't, if you're not familiar with reading the Gospels, like, just get used to something here, okay? Um, like, don't make snide comments around Jesus. It doesn't go over well, okay? As a matter of fact, if that makes you upset, you would probably love reading about Jesus because that made him upset. That made him so upset that he actually told a parable here. So take a look at this. Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse 16. Jesus replies to this guy, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. So right there, you know that this guy is wealthy. Most people in the first century in Jesus' day lived in one-room houses. Okay, this guy is preparing a great banquet, so he has, he has a lot of money to buy a lot of food, which is very unusual back then. 
And then on top of that, he's got a huge house with multiple rooms to fit people. And later on, we're just going to see how big. But like literally, it, the economy and the class system back then, it was like, you know, upper class was like this, middle class was like this, and then poverty, lower class was like this. I mean, that's how it was. It was so out of sync. It was so different than even anything that we see today. It was similar to what we might see in the Middle East uh, today if we were to go over there right now, but it's not the same. It was even worse and different back then, okay? Verse 17, here's what it says. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said, I have just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. And then verse 20 says, still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Listen, I'm going to give you free advice, people, okay? This is a life hack, okay? You don't even have to tithe for me to give you this advice. (laughs) If you invite somebody over to dinner, and they say, I can't come because... I just got new oxen. (laughs) They're lying. They don't like you. You know what it'd be like? It'd be like, afterwards, you're like, hey, Caleb, you want to go to lunch? And I'm like, you know what? I'd love to. I'm washing my hair. (laughs) That's the same effect. As, As funny and comical as it seems to us today, it would have seemed comical to them. But it's also taboo. You know it's kind of not taboo in America. If you don't want to go somewhere, you just throw in a little white lie, you exaggerate something, or Aunt Sally's dead for the third time again. She's died again. You know, but back then, that was just like, you don't refuse something. Especially if you get invited by somebody very, very wealthy. Because obviously this guy has prestige, right? He has paper invitations. People really didn't have paper back then. Okay, they brought out the invitations. He has a servant, probably has more. He's inviting all of his friends, okay? So this is the most wealthy guy in town. And you would probably go. You know what it would be like? It would be like if you were at home tonight and your cell phone rings and it's an international number and you think it's a scam. But you're like, I like messing with scammers. So I'm going to answer it. And you answer it. And you know who's on the phone? Queen Elizabeth. And you're like, Liz... What's up? (laughs) She said, hey, I want to invite you over for dinner on Wednesday. I'm going to fly you out. I'll give you $10,000 to eat here. You know, you can stay at the palace, hang out. I'm willing to say, I'm willing to bet you would say yes, right? You're like, I don't believe in the monarchy. Okay, it doesn't matter. (laughs) Liz called you. (laughs) You're going to go. Kind of like this. And so if you said, you know what, Liz, I just bought five pair of oxen. People are going to be like, you are a moron. That's the way it was back then. These people are like, no way. They would never turn that down. And so he sends out these invitations to more people. And here's what happens. Verse 24, the servant came back and reported to this to his master. The owner of the house became very angry and ordered his servant, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Now, now these, these four words, we, we know what these words mean at face value, but when everybody heard these words in the first century, their jaw would have hit the ground. You don't cross economic barriers. You stay with your class. That's what you do. That's really taboo. That's pushing it. But here's the deal. Especially when Jesus gives definition, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. These can definitely mean people that don't have any money, people that you know, are crippled, people that are blind, people that are lame and born that way. But you know what? It can mean something much different. Like poor in the original language can also be translated as somebody with little value. You ever felt like that? You ever had one of those days when you felt like you had little value? When you feel like nobody is on your team, nobody likes you, you don't know what your purpose is, you're like, nobody would miss me if I was gone, which you know, hopefully, is a lie from the pit of hell. But I think we've all had those days, and some of us, depending on certain circumstances in our life, or maybe something that we have, we deal with that on a regular basis. 
Do you know somebody like that? Do you know somebody that needs to know that they do have value? That if they're in a relationship with Jesus, they can be in there and that he will never leave. And then Jesus says the crippled, those who take longer time to get places, okay? Have you ever been behind somebody, like you get off of an airplane, like they land after about seven hours or six hours of flying, you know, and the person in front of you is going like this, and you're just like, (laughs) hurry up, hurry up. Some of you are like, no, I don't do that. Well, I do. I live in Los Angeles, okay? We are always in a hurry, even if we don't need to be, because we never know who's after us. (laughs) Jesus is like, what about the people that take a little bit more time to get places? What about the people that have been hurt in accidents? And then the blind. That, That doesn't just mean that those who are blind. It could also mean those who are slow to perceiving. You know, I, I'm willing to bet there are quite a, a few of us in this room where we have some sort of uh, maybe mental health disorder. I'll be the first one to throw my hand up. I have ADHD. I have ADHD. Squirrel. <laughs> I really do. I'm on medication for it. I'm not ashamed to say that. But you know what? I can use it for the good. I can read a 400-page book in two hours. <laughs> then my wife asked me to fill out one insurance form, and that'll take me nine hours. Just because you have something like that does not mean that you are in the penalty box for the rest of your life. Sometimes it's your weaknesses that you can leverage to make you stronger. And then you have the lame, those who were born with defects from birth, those who have diseases and so on and so forth. Jesus is like, if you really want to throw a party that God would get behind, invite the people like that. Invite the people that nobody else invites Invite the people that that you would never spend time with. Get to know people that are different from you. And so he invites everybody from the lower class and middle class. And towns, by the way, this town is probably like between 100 to 500 people. So for him to have a big enough house to fit 500 people, now do you see why it's such an insult when the first people are like, I can't come, I just get married. They really don't like this person, and he thought they were their friends. Now, this is so cool. Take a look at this. Verse 4. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still more room. Okay, this house is bigger than the whole town. Do you see how everything's exaggerated? I mean, God has got a really big home because God has got ridiculously large love and grace. And here's what the master says. Master told the servant, go into the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you that not one, not one of those who were invited will taste my banquet. And now everybody would have had an aneurysm and passed out when they heard him say this. When they heard him say, hey, you know, go out to the roads and the country lanes. Because he's saying, go to the outskirts of town. In other words, go outside the country. Go invite the non-Jewish people. You talk about taboo. He says, you go cross racial barriers, ethnic barriers. You bring them in. Go out to the roads, go out to the country lanes. And the country lanes, in the original language, is so cool. It paints this picture of somebody who is behind a wall or a hedge maze or a hedge, like, walls in front of them to protect them from what's coming. You ever felt like that? You ever been so wounded in a relationship or by a community where you feel like you have to protect yourself and people are only going to get this close to you? Listen, if that's you, believe me, more than you know, I understand what you're talking about. Let me just tell you something. That is not healthy. You're not protecting yourself. And that is not helping you. And that is making your life worse and everybody else's life worse. I look at this and I'm like, wow, those first people, they didn't get this principle. But if you and I can understand this principle, it will help us love people that are not like us, people we may not understand, people we may not understand why they're in this relationship, why they do this, why they do that. Hear me out on this. Grace is for everyone and that includes anyone. Grace is for everyone, and that includes anyone. Let, let's try this together, just to make sure that we all get it. Grace is for, what's that word? 
Okay, not everyone said that. Let's try that again, okay? Grace is for? Everyone. And that includes? Anyone. And I felt like saying dot, 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 almost added this, even the any ones you don't like. Because guess what? You are someone else's anyone. And some of you are like, no, I'm not. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yes, Mr. Narcissist, you are. There are people when they see you coming, walking down the hallway, they're like, oh, good night. And they turn around. Listen, listen. There's no, normality is a myth. You all are weird. I'm weird. I'm cool with it. Okay? I'm terrified of peacocks, but I love Star Wars. That's weird. I really am. If a peacock came up here, I'd pass out after I threw up. I'd probably throw up while I was passed out too. The thing is, is that you are somebody else's anyone. You've got to learn how to love the people that don't like you and the people you don't like. Well, we live in a society today that says you can shut people out if they trigger you. You can shut people out if they hurt you, if they're harmful or whatever. You know what Jesus says? No. That's not a biblical principle. That's a wicked principle. You're taking liberties you don't have. You don't get the right. Love has no exception clause. Like, like seriously, grace is for everyone, and that includes anyone. So how can we live this out? What does it look like for you and I to live this out? There are three things I want to tell you, and then, like, really, two or three things, and then a question I want you to ask, okay? First thing is this. Never allow fear to determine somebody's value. Never allow fear to determine someone's value. I think that a lot of these people who are listening to Jesus, they didn't want the Gentiles to come into the kingdom, into what God was doing. They didn't want God to do a new thing because they were afraid. They were afraid of losing their positions. They were afraid of losing their authority. They were afraid that their community was going to change. They were afraid that things were going to be different. Here's the deal. Get used to it. People change. Why do you think social media is crazy? Why do you think our world is crazy? Because people are crazy. And we change all the time. You are a different version of yourself than you were last month. Even if just this much right here. Sometimes they were afraid because they really never got to know a person. Hear me out on this. Fear is not a bad thing. Like, I don't like it when people say, well, fear, fear is bad. No, it's not. It's ridiculous. When somebody tells you that, it's like, no, think deeper. God gave you the capacity to feel fear for a reason. If you're hiking and you see a rattlesnake, you should be afraid. You know what you should not do? Pick it up and say, this is my pet now. Name it Sally. Put a pink collar on it and love it and snuggle it every night. You'll be dead. Congratulations. Right? You should be afraid of a snake. Fear is not a bad thing. But when fear starts to determine what your relationships are and determine the direction of your life, fear becomes toxic. We naturally fear whatever we don't understand or whatever threatens us, what makes us feel out of control. So what's the answer? The answer is to lean into your faith with God who knows everything and has all power and is unconditionally loving. Okay, but too often today, we, love, we let fear lead us. And a lot of people know that. We're going into a presidential election year, right? Get ready for it. People are going to be controlled by fear because people know that if you get somebody to be afraid, you can control them. If somebody gets you to be too afraid, you're going to listen to what they have to say. You need to be careful. Never allow fear to determine somebody's value. Everybody has the same intrinsic value. Everybody is somebody that God created and Jesus died for. And I don't care if they are a right-wing radical conservative. I don't care if they are a left-wing radical liberal. Here's the deal. That person is still somebody that Jesus died for, that God created in his image. And when we mistreat people, no matter what, we are spitting on the image of God. We are misappropriating the blood of Christ. Here's the second thing I want you to do. Accept everyone, but don't agree with just anyone. Accept everyone, but don't agree with just anyone. Like I said, when you follow Jesus, you have to love people. You have to agree with, you have to accept them. You don't get a choice. 
when I say accept, I mean loving somebody for who they are, where they are, what they're going through, no matter what they believe, no matter what they've done, you love them. You accept them because God created them and Jesus died for them. You do not have to agree with every decision somebody makes, with every relationship that somebody is in. You don't have to agree with every political uh, platform that somebody supports or every opinion that somebody holds, okay? True love is built on acceptance. Cheap love is built on agreement. Okay, well, my parents, they kicked me out. I, I told them, I said, I love you, but I, had, I told them that I had changed my view on sexuality, that I believed two things back then like I do now, that God designed sexual intimacy to be expressed in marriage between a man and a woman, but a theological conviction is never a catalyst to devalue another human being. Okay? That, that like, your biblical beliefs do not give you the right to mistreat other people, to devalue anyone. And people are like, well, you know, how can you believe both? Well, it's very easy. Very easy. Here's how it's easy, okay? My beliefs on marriage, relationships, sex, those are my beliefs. That's what they are. Okay? I don't prowl around in other people's bedrooms. I'd rather not. <laughs> that does not in any way determine my view of another person. And to say, well, you have to change this to have the good view over here. You know what? I think you have a more shallow view of people than I do. Because I choose to live in the tension. Because that's where lives are changed. Okay? Here's the third thing I want you to do. Trust Jesus' words, even if you disagree. This is huge. Are you willing to trust Jesus, even if you disagree with him? Now, some of you who have been in, like, church since God was a boy, like, you've been a Christian that long, <laughs> you might automatically say, Caleb, how can thou say that? <laughs> trust Jesus' words, even if you disagree. I don't disagree with Jesus. I do. Doesn't mean I don't follow him. Let me give you an example. Jesus says, if somebody slaps you on one cheek, turns to them the other. Somebody, you know, does something to you. You turn. I don't want to turn the other cheek. I want revenge. I'm good at it. My college career, like, it, it proved it. I was skilled. People still have no idea what struck them. <laughs> I don't like the fact that I don't get to get even. I don't, how about this? I don't like the fact that I have to love everybody. Like, I love that Christianity, that Jesus is all about that. I don't like that I have to do it. I love it when everybody loves me. I don't like loving everybody. Do you? Okay, so I'm the only <laughs> weirdo in the room then, okay? Like, seriously. I don't love, I don't like, I don't like to love people who have stabbed me in the back, who have hurt me. I don't like to love people that cut me off on the 101. Okay, I don't like to love people who thought The Last Jedi was actually a good movie. <laughs> but you know what? I'm commanded by God to love. And I have people all the time who ask me, Caleb, you know, I, I feel this way, you know, about my attraction, but, you know, I've I've been taught to believe this, and I think the Bible says this, and I don't know what, what to do with what I believe and what I feel. And I say, well, first of all, I, I can't imagine what that must be like. I'm so sorry. And I'm praying for you, and I'm here for you, no matter what you decide, what your next steps are. And they're like, well, what am I supposed to do? I'm like, well, I can't tell you that. Your sexuality is between you and God. I do ask them this question, though. Are you willing to follow Jesus are you willing to do whatever he says, even if your romantic dreams never come true? Are you willing to follow Jesus? Are you willing to be more devoted to him than you are your own concept of life here on earth or anything else? See, what we're trying to do here, people, is build influence. Bring people in, show them that Jesus loves them, and if you come out to somebody, not shoving them back into the same closet you came out of by saying, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, then you and I are done. Well, that's childish. Eventually, you're going to be alone. You're not going to have anybody around you. 
And I get it. Some people are very toxic. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the everyday people. So when you, you need that influence with people to tell them about how much Jesus loves them. And if you just don't know how to get this influence, and you're like, yes, I know grace is for everyone. That includes anyone. And I just don't know what to do. What should I do? I got invited to the party. I got invited to this wedding. I don't know what to do. Pronouns, what should I do? I want you to ask yourself this question. What am I willing to do to keep and build influence with, and you fill in the blank? Your son, your daughter, your best friend, your coworker. What am I willing to do? to keep and build influence with. Listen, if it's my kids, I'm going to charge the gates of hell with a squirt gun. I will do whatever it takes short of sinning to keep and build influence with them so that I earn the right to be one of the first texts or phone calls they make when life hits them. And I get the chance to share Jesus with them. And some of you may not agree with me. Here's the deal. I don't care. I really don't. Like, I care more about um, the Cleveland Indians. Because <laughs> when it comes to somebody I love, that, I mean, it's, it's all out the window, seriously. All out the window. Like, how does all that go together? What do you do? Well, welcome to Christianity. It's confusing. It's not just black and white. Some things are, but this kind of stuff, emotional attachment, relationships, it isn't. I stand firm with my biblical convictions. That makes me love people even more. It doesn't make me look at them differently or anything like that. And I hope that we can do that for one another because that's when you understand what messy grace really is. That's when you understand God's love. That's when you understand that being a Christian is not being about having your best tomorrow, today, being a Christian is about learning how to be uncomfortable, being willing to sacrifice who you are for who he is so that you can love people the way he did. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for uh, this series. May our love for you and others be irresistible, Lord. May we treat people so well that they cannot help but see you through our love and our actions and our words. I pray, Father, that we will learn that we cannot change anyone. We must love everyone and point them to you and build a relationship, get relational influence. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for a church like RMCC that is willing to have these conversations and say love it's so worth it. Thank you, Lord. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.